Okay, I would like to welcome everybody to the final module of Looking Forward to 2021 for today, which is Space, uh, sponsored by the Pittsburgh Brewers Guild. Uh, we'd also like to thank our continued sponsors, uh, BSG Craft Brewing, uh, Craft Beer Professionals, uh, definitely a great Facebook page uh, with about 10,000 members that everybody should check out. Of course, our partners in this, the Pittsburgh Brewers Guild, and we are the Master Brewers. So with that, I'm going to bring in our moderator as well as our panelists for today. So welcome everybody, uh, appreciate everyone being here. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Brian Eaton of Grist House Craft Brewery, our moderator for this module. Awesome, thank you, Adam. And uh, thank you to everyone at the NBAA for uh, um, inviting us to partner with them for uh, what so far has been a, a great day of uh, uh, modules, uh, everything from engineering to uh, century panels with beer and uh, and even uh, uh, writers and, and the written word. And so uh, really uh, enjoyed the uh, the dialogue around, uh, um, you know, one of our favorite uh, products. We're all kind of in this industry and with a passion for beer. And so uh, it was really great uh, today to hear from uh, industry experts like Liz Pratt and Lindsay Bauer on uh, Century Panels, and then uh, some insight from uh, Ashton Lewis and Mitch Steele on the uh, the art of beer writing. I thought everything was uh, extremely enlightening, and so we just want to uh, thank everybody for joining us. And uh, I think uh, you know everybody's going to enjoy our panel on uh, on space and the uh, uh, the tap room experience and uh, uh, kind of pre, during, and and post COVID. And so. Uh, rather than give you an elevator speech about the uh, Pittsburgh Brewers Guild right now, I'm just going to uh, encourage everyone, uh, especially those who uh, may plan a visit to the Pittsburgh region, region to uh, to browse our website, which is pittsburghbreweries.com, uh, where you can learn about uh, specific breweries, their uh, their hours, their offerings, um, uh, you know, dog friendly, bike friendly, what they're doing during COVID, things like that. You can create your own brewery trail, um, find existing uh, trails that we put together. And then also some uh, extra helpful content that we've been putting together uh, during the whole COVID-19 uh, pandemic and uh, how you can still help support uh, local breweries during these times. So uh, now I'm going to uh, give a quick uh, overview on our panel um, and uh, uh, introduce uh, all of them. And then uh, we'll go one by one um, and uh, do each of their presentations with a uh, short uh, kind of Q&A after that. And uh, then once we've had all the uh, uh panelists uh, present, then we will open it up to uh, uh, participant uh, and uh, questions and answers. So if you have any questions, please uh, put them into the um, comment section on the Facebook Live uh, feed. Um, so right now we're going to uh, start off by introducing Joel Houston, uh, who is joining us from Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, Joel is the head of a commercial strategy practice area for First Key, which is a brewing industry consulting firm. Uh, he has visited several hundred tap rooms all over the world, and he specializes in helping breweries define, design efficient tap room spaces, <clears throat> focusing on the look, feel, and ambiance. Uh, previously, several, or he previously served in uh, a commercial strategy, marketing, and brand roles at Molson and Coors in Canada. And so, during his presentation, Joel will focus on how breweries can leverage tap room and space to strengthen their brands and improve customer loyalty and grow sales. Uh, one point of uh, um, housekeeping and a point of disclosure is that uh, Mike Deserik, who's our executive director of the Pittsburgh Brewers Guild, is actually works with Joel on occasion as uh, one of First Key's representatives in the Mid-Atlantic region. So I just wanted that note to be made. Um, our second presenter today is going to be Tim Brady. Um, and Tim is the uh, owner of Whetstone Station Restaurant and Brewery in Brattleboro, Vermont. But today he is actually joining us from Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, Tim has an extensive uh, hospitality and uh, brewing experience. He was an instructor with the University of Vermont Business of Craft Beer Program. And then he was appointed as the service ambassador for the Brewers Association. Um, as mentioned, Tim is an uh, avid RV traveler and hence why he is uh, joining us from Asheville. And Tim is going to talk to us about how to instill a culture of great service, even in this pandemic driven to go environment. And uh, finally, to tie everything together, our last presenter is Kate Bernat, who is joining us from Missoula, Montana. Uh, Kate is a reporter and editor with Good Beer Hunting, 
and Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, as well as other outlets. Uh, recently, uh, Kate received three awards for her writing from the North American Guild of Beer Writers. So congratulations to Kate on that great honor. And Kate will be uh, sharing her insights based on her reporting and industry knowledge on what a post-COVID environment may look like from a taproom and beer consumer behavior standpoint. So to uh, kick things off, we're going to have uh, Joel brought up and uh, he'll be the first to present. All right, just let me get the screen share happening here. Everybody see that okay? All right. Thank you, Brian. And uh, good afternoon or good morning, everybody, depending where you are. Um, and Brian mentioned it briefly. You probably saw my bio, but if not, um, I spent 23 years in corporate beer with Molson and Coors Canada and another nine years so far with First Key as a consultant. Uh, so most of my career has been spent in beer. So there I am. Um, one thing to keep in mind as I go through my presentation today is, uh, you know, the content has been designed to include you know, key on-site brewery elements, both pre and post COVID. Um, the pandemic's obviously impacted on how local craft breweries operate. So that's going to be factored into today's discussion. But um, I think we also have to assume that one day the craft brewing landscape will return to normal uh, or as close as we can get to normal. And uh, that, you know, a lot of the material we covered today is still going to be relevant in the future. So I don't want to just sort of make the whole thing about COVID and pretend that we're never going to go back to where we were. I think at least, you know, the world will look somewhat similar to the way it used to in the future. So that assumption has been made as I go through my presentation. And Joel, not to uh, interrupt, but uh, I don't believe your screen share is coming up uh, properly. Oh, okay. Well, let's try again then. Hang on for a second here. I'm looking at Apple I'll share. Hang on for a second. Might need a little help then because I've, I've got the presentation in the background. Um, application window. Uh, Joel, if you're not able to, uh, to pull it up, uh, I can pull it up for you. Uh, and if you just want to, uh, give me cues when you'd like to move to the next slide, uh, that's not a problem at all. Okay. I'm just, uh, super disappointed because it worked fine when we did our <laughs> rehearsal. Trust, that's how, that's how it always goes. So, uh. Let me just let me always oh, technical difficulties. Absolutely. No matter no matter how much you practice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's all right. Okay, well if you want to do that, Adam, go for it. Uh what is uh your your the name of your the title your the file the file? Um give me one second. Apologies, everyone watching here. Um no. Yes. Okay. Apologies, everyone. Here we go. There we go, Joel. Looking good. Okay. Do I need to do anything except just start talking? No, just go ahead. Like I said, if you uh, if you can give me a cue uh, when you'd like to move to the next slide. Uh, uh, go ahead. Two slides to to the first slide on. There we go. Branding. All right. Go ahead. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so each brewery size appeals to a different type of customer. It's important to have a, a clear understanding of that in order to customize your, your operation top to bottom to meet the needs of your target customer. And obviously in a neighborhood craft brewery, uh, the tap room is where everything happens. So all core branding elements apply. And just because you're small, 
doesn't mean you don't need to create a compelling brand bundle. And given the rapid growth of craft tap rooms over the past few years and, you know, the impact of COVID has been sort of an only the strong survive kind of impact. I would argue that differentiation from the competition is arguably more critical than ever. So core branding elements typically include things like mission and vision, your brewery story, core values, your target market, the competitive landscape, key differentiators, your name, your logo, key messages, the customer experience. We're going to talk about all these things today. Employee behavior, media channels, promotional activity, and the, the look and feel. And it doesn't have to be carved on a, a plaque or, or laminated onto a brochure, but you're going to need to put some work into it. So the brewery story is, is very important, should play a key role in your why. And when I say your why, uh, I mean, you know, what you stand for, what you're passionate about, what truly makes you different. And I would suggest that you make your why ownable and be thoughtful about not just focusing on what you do and how you do it. A lot of craft breweries will say their why is, you know, making great beer in small batches with the finest ingredients. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not ownable. It's not going to set you apart from the crowd. So what does an ownable why look like? Um, and I picked a, a brewery that's actually in my neck of the woods that I think has a pretty compelling why and I'll read it to you directly off their website. Located less than 40 minutes east of Vancouver at the end of Burrard Inlet, Port Moody is a small and thriving community surrounded by nature. Nestled at the foot of Eagle Mountain, the protected harbor invites boating and kayaking while forested parklands above are quintessential west coast wilderness, offering hiking trails, lakes and mountain vistas. Our name is very literal. We're proud to be located on Port Moody's famed Brewers Row across from Rocky Point Park, where we have deep roots. Our connection to this location and the community around it is a vital part of our identity. And while we make our home here, our dream is to be connected to every community. Wherever there is a park, there is a parkside. The Parkside Brewery celebrates everything that makes up who we are, friends, nature, community, and a sense of home. So what I like about that is you get a real good feel for where they are, what they're passionate about, what they stand for. Doesn't really focus on their beer, um, which is, you know, to me, that doesn't mean beer can't be part of your why. But I think that paints a pretty vivid picture. You feel like you know these guys, even if you've never visited the place. We can go to the next slide. Next thing I wanted to talk about was the beer component of the tap room. So my opinion. Beer quality is number one. There's nothing else that's close. And it should be measured against the very best craft brewers. And that's going to require the hiring of a skilled head brewer. In a lot of cases, your head brewer is going to be the face of the brewery in the community. So he or she should not just be a great brewer, but they, they should also be able to engage with customers and be comfortable in front of an audience. You don't want to have that person hidden in a back room. A diverse and evolving portfolio will keep customers interested, making return visits to the tap room and spreading the gospel. So be prepared to offer bold and challenging options for craft beer lovers, including you know, special release, seasonal collaboration brews, as well as more approachable styles for those leaning more towards the mainstream. But ultimately, your easier drinking beers are going to do most of the heavy lifting from a volume perspective. That's always the way it goes. Product education is key and will require comprehensive staff training. Now, not all customers are going to want to know intimate details about your beers, but some of them will. And staff needs to be prepared to speak to that upon request. Written materials will help support this and should be written in plain language with definitions included. For example, and see the, the photo in the top left, um, small example, but Flight tray should be a creative extension of your brewery's why and should be clearly marked. Customers should not have to guess or recall which style they're sampling. I still go to tap rooms where they pour your flight and then just give it to you, expect you to remember what beers you're drinking that they've explained to you. It's not going to happen. So you see in that picture, you've got an information card behind each beer that tells you what they are, what the ingredients are, what the name of the beer is, etc. 
We can go to the next slide. I'm going to talk now about the uh, customer experience. So the customer experience at the tap room is made up of many moving parts. And when combined, these elements form the customer perception of your brand. Uh, Tim Brady is going to go uh, do a deeper dive on this uh, in a few minutes. But for now, I'm going to provide kind of a 30,000 foot perspective. So layout, decor, ambience and functionality are all critical components of the customer experience. So design your tap room to encourage socialization. And that usually means providing a variety of seating options. You know, high tops, low tops, picnic style, bar seating, if possible, outdoor seating. And incorporating some nuances from the local area in your taproom can play a key role in your why and help set you apart from the crowd. Most customers will appreciate that you're leveraging something unique from your part of the world, whatever that might be. And when, when I say that, I mean, I always like to, when I visit a taproom, I like to sort of step away. I know where I am, obviously, but step away and think if I didn't know where I was, would I be able to guess where I was from the decor of the taproom? So every place in the world is unique. And if you can leverage some of that in your tap room, I think it's super cool, not just for locals, but for visitors. Customer service excellence is uh, rarely achieved. I don't see it very often, but it's a key, it can be a key competitive advantage. So recruit carefully, select your staff based on attitude, and when I say that, I mean those who want to be there for the right reasons. Um, train and launch them properly and compensate them well. Don't ask them to wear a bunch of different hats because you're going to burn them out. And overworked and unhappy employees will be noticed by customers and it's going to negative, negatively impact on their, on their top room experience. Ultimately, you want your customers to feel safe, comfortable, and engaged in your top room. Because for a lot of them, it's a happy place. It's one of their happy places. I know it's one of mine. So to maintain that, you're going to have to be diligent in addressing all customer needs and constantly evolving your taproom environment in the spirit of remaining true to your brand. Well, let's move on to the next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about promotional activity. So pre-COVID, uh, most promotional activity took place in the taproom and likely included you know, special release parties, intermittent launches of seasonal beers and collaboration brews, and that would typically generate a local talk value and customer interest and drive foot traffic to the top room. And then there are usually sponsorship opportunities for events and sort of philanthropic causes that resonate with the local community, uh, leverage elements that matter to them. So that helps to generate goodwill and also contributes to top room traffic. And obviously excellence in social media is required to generate awareness and encourage customers to attend these special events and a high quality website is also a must. And while these key promotional elements are still critically important, driving large crowds to the top room during COVID is not necessarily a good idea. And a more creative approach is required to work around some of these barriers. And I'll give you a couple of examples of uh, what I think are creative solutions to, you know, COVID lineups. Prior to the global pandemic, Great Notion Brewing had a buoyant direct-to-consumer business model. Fans of the Portland, Oregon brewery regularly formed conga lines, 100 people long, waiting to buy fresh cans of culinary-inspired fruited sour ales, decadent imperial stouts, and hop-saturated hazy IPAs. By mid-March, though, selling beer to large lines of human beings became a potential health hazard. We don't want to be, we don't want to see 50 or 100 people waiting in line before we open, standing too close together with no masks on, says one of Great Notion's co-founders. Instead, Great Notion started releasing its beer on smartphones. This spring, the brewery rolled out an immersive app filled with its forest dwelling illustrated characters, that's a title there, why? including the Sasquatch lookalike Jamie D. Fans can play games, read tasting notes, and order cans for pickup or local delivery. Now Great Notions app processes 90% of the newly cash-free breweries transactions, and nobody rushes to the brewery at noon. 
A second example, a little closer to home, closer to Pittsburgh, Brew Gentleman in Braddock, Pennsylvania, used e-commerce to launch a new sales channel and packaging. To date, the Pittsburgh area brewery only sold its, its in-demand hazy IPAs on draft at its taproom and to-go in growlers. But in late May, the brewery began packaging its flagship IPA in slim 12-ounce cans sold online for pickup. The pivot solves two problems. First, the taproom focus model was growing crowded and com competitive. Secondly, road tripping and waiting in line for beer was a potential sales barrier, especially during a pandemic. In short, they took the idea of the taproom and put that online. So that's that's kind of my that's my snapshot. I don't want to say too much because the other presenters have things to say that are directly or indirectly related to what I just said. So I'll open it up for for a question or two. Yeah, thank you, Joe. That was a excellent uh, overview. Um, so you kind of mentioned uh, how a tap room needs to and how a brewery needs to kind of tie all the elements together, um, their tap list, their decor, uh, uh, you know, the story that they're trying to tell. Uh, you gave a couple good examples. I like the one, I believe I caught it was Parkside uh, was a great uh, example. Um, not to, and, and no need to name any names, but uh, any poor examples that you can think of uh, through your experiences, things that uh, you walked in and, and you're like, man, this really misses the mark. Well, that's a that's a broad. And I actually have I actually have a um, I have a I think a I don't know if it's a better example, but I have a an example of a brewery that I think that does a great job tying everything together. And I'll, I'll I'll talk about that. I know that's not exactly your question, Brian, but um, you know what? It's it's hard to be specific because I think that most of the craft breweries I visit are to a certain extent sort of cookie cutter. They it's almost like they've read a checklist. It's like, here's the things you have to do. You have to have this, 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 this. You have to have a little bit of corrugated tin. You have to have some, you know, reclaimed wood. And, and there's nothing wrong with those things. But I find that in most cases, I'd say 95% of the time, if you ask me where I was, I wouldn't be able to answer. I, I'm in a tap room. They, they, a lot of them look the same. Um, and I think those ones miss the mark in terms of capturing the spirit of wherever they are. There, there has to be something unique about where you are in the world. Um, for instance, you know, Kate's in, in Missoula, Montana. A tap room in Missoula, Montana should not look the same as a tap room in Austin, Texas, should not look the same as a tap room in Carlsbad, California. They should be different. Um, and it's hard for me to be specific about that, but I, I'm gonna use an example of, so, my, my short answer to your question is, I think most tap rooms miss the mark. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you an example of one that I think does a great job. Now, it's a little bit unfair because these guys are from Colombia, South America. It's, it's based in North America, this brew. It's in Vancouver. Um, but they're from Colombia, which gives them a bit of an unfair advantage. But I think they've done a, an amazing job tying together everything. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this because there's a lot here um, just to sort of, give you an example of somebody that's tied it all together very nicely. So these guys um, located in downtown Vancouver and their brand names are all tied to the Spanish language. So their brand names are things like Mapale. They have a pale LA called Ay Ay Ay, uh, Monita, Totuma, Conchita. So all the brand names are Spanish. Uh, very unique. Uh, the portfolio features a stable of styles with a Colombian twist. So they have a Guava Saison, uh, they have a sour that uses Lulo pulp fruit. They have an Andean ale, which uses panela, which is a raw, unrefined whole cane sugar from Colombia. Um, they also specialize in terms of food. They specialize in ceviche. I don't know how many people are familiar with that, but they have six different kinds of ceviche. And they also serve uh, platachos and arepas and empanadas. So all their food is, is Spanish. They have a lot of Colombian artwork on the walls and artifacts of these little authentic statues that they have in cubby holes in the top room entrance kind of recessed into the wall. Um, they have a, a huge and very unique logo uh, on the outside of the brewery. Um, it's a, it's a girl, a sort of a, uh, I, I can't, I can't explain it, but it's, it's very um, Spanish looking. Uh, this girl um, that's replicated on all their tap handles, their glassware, their point of sale items, all their merchandise. They have Latin video nights, live Colombian folk music. The stuff in their merchandise area is all um, 
uh, Colombian theme. So it's they have their growlers are shaped like traditional Colombian pottery, which is called chorotes. Um, they they sell uh, bags called mojilas, which are like uh, backpacks, uh, sombreros, and they sell these Juana ponchos. When people come in, they say hola. They don't say hello. When they leave, they say adios. They don't say goodbye. So you know, while most people can't play the Colombian card, obviously, um, I still think there's going to be there's bound to be some parallels for you to use those types of levers wherever you are to, uh, to in, in your part of the world that are going to have a positive impact on customers. And when they walk out, you know, they'll say, Hey, that place was cool. Um, it was different. It was unique. Uh, I think that's the goal here. Excellent. Well, thank you, Joel. Um, we're going to go on to our next presenter, but we'll uh, have you back up here for uh, some Q and a uh, with the group. If that sounds good. You bet. I'll be here. Thank you, Joel. Uh, next up uh, is Tim Brady, who is the owner of uh, Whetstone Station Restaurant and Brewery. Um, Tim has been passionate about craft beer since his whole first home brewing experience over 25 years ago. He has frontline experience in a hospitality uh, realm, including uh, owner and operator of an inn, a craft beer bar, a campground, and an entertainment complex, as well as a brewery, restaurant, and beer garden. Uh, Tim likes to share his passions for beer technology and marketing as an active member of the Brewers Association Board of Directors and as a strategist with a Vermont marketing firm and an instructor for the UVM Business of Craft Beer Program. Uh, so Tim is uh, going to be uh, speaking on uh, how to instill a culture of great service, uh, even in this uh, pandemic driven to go environment. So uh, Tim, I'm going to kick it over to you. Thanks, Brian. Um, did my screen share? Share? Okay, good. Um, so yeah, I mean, normally I, I talk about uh, providing great service. Um, I've had the privilege of being the uh, service ambassador for the Brewers Association for the past several years. And I've got to travel to a bunch of different guild meetings um, all around the country and talk about uh, providing great service in person. Um, well, obviously, a lot of that has changed in the past, uh, oh my God, it's, it's six months, seven months now. So today I want to talk a little bit about um, how we can still manage to make the service that we provide an impactful part of the guest experience, even if it is um, either socially distanced or in a to-go format. Um, the first thing uh, that is really critical to keep in mind is do what you are comfortable doing. Um, guests will sense your comfort level with the choices that you've made. So whether that be uh, complying, simply complying with state and local laws, or whether it be that you're taking things a little bit uh, more strict than, than is required, um, make sure that the choice that you're making is comfortable for you as the business owner and for your staff. Uh, the uh, really, you know, if I walk into a, a brew pub and I, I chance my way out during this time and I'm going to go support the local uh, community, be it buying beer to go or ordering a beer in your tap room, and if I feel that the staff isn't comfortable with the situation, that absolutely uh, will impact my comfort level. So make sure that you know you're all comfortable collectively as a team with what protocols you have in place. And speaking of those um, those protocols, make sure that you know those details as to how you're operating are updated every place that you possibly can. Um, you know, some very simple ones, Google bi business listing, your own website, untapped, places that beer lovers are going to be taking a look to see, okay, can I go have a beer in person? Do you have outdoor uh, dining available? Are you open? Are you doing to go? Can I get beer to go? Um, can I get draft beer to go? Like, what are the details? Do I need to register? Do I need a reservation? There's so many things that have, shifted uh, and they're so different now in, in every location. And quite honestly, they're changing week over week in a lot of cases. I mean, if up in Vermont, you know, we, we've, they've done a very good job, I would say, as a state of handling kind of the COVID spread. But a lot of that is this, this ongoing week by week change of like this week, you're allowed to do this. Next week, 
So make sure that you're you're taking the effort to kind of go out and make sure that you're updating that any place that your guests might be looking. Uh, Facebook, uh, another good example, because people really are unclear, and you know they do want to support you. Uh, there's a lot of programs kind of coming up actually from the BA. They have uh, the Small Brewery Sunday, for example, coming up soon. Small Brewery Sunday, you know, it's going to be saying, "Hey, go support your local brew pub. Go support your local brewery." Um, people want to know how can I do that. So make sure that you're communicating that. Convey what your protocols are um, everywhere from those online locations to signage when I arrive. You know, do you have a host? Um, you know, when I walk in the door, like, can is it is it clear to me what I need to do to kind of enter your space? Do I need to register? Do I need to fill out a form? Do I need to check in with the host? Um, you know, is it a mask all the time? I mean, what are your rules? Um, one big one that has come up at a couple places uh, that I've traveled to in the past few months are time limits, you know, because reduced capacity, you know, a lot of places only operating at 20, 25% capacity. Um, is there a limit in the amount of time that, you know, that I can spend in your location? If there is, make sure you're communicating that up front. Um, you know, I had the unfortunate experience of being at a, a place that I was really enjoying. They had a, a live musician, um, you know, spending money always a good tipper. Um, but still they came over the table and it's like, Hey, just so you know, uh, you've got, you know, seven to 10 minutes left. It's like ten, seven to 10 minutes left of what? Apparently there was a 45 minute limit, which is okay. Great. If you had told me when I first came in, but, um, I had just ordered another beer. Now, are you asking me to like pound my beer? I mean, make sure you're communicating that stuff up front. That's certainly going to turn someone off of returning. And one big thing we want to keep in mind is like, you know, what we're doing right now is going to be really impactful as to how people feel about your brand when we're on the other side of this. So, you know, you want to make sure that they're, they're coming back feeling good about it. Uh, demonstrate sanitation. Um, you know, breweries, I think one thing that we have kind of is a, a real handle on sanitation. I mean, like, you know, 90% of our job as a brewer is, uh, you know, cleaning. So being really obvious about it, be over the top. Uh, even if that means in your downtime, your host is spraying down your bathroom door handles, you know, I mean, just like looking visibly like they are cleaning things in an extreme way. Um, you know, the sanitized and available sign that you see there, that's something that we added um, just to kind of point out that, you know, that the tables were cleaned. Um, we made some you know metal signs and we just dropped them on the tables as they're clean, which kind of just says, hey, like, you know, rather than it just being a, a sea of tables, um, marked, you can sit here, you cannot. This says, okay, cool. That table has actually um, been sanitized. One great, one big on-premise thing that um, you know we kind of just heard, but um, make your outdoor space. I mean, in the beginning, right? It was like, oh, you have outdoor space or you're putting your indoor furniture outside to comply with your rules. Fine, yeah, that was fine. As we're dragging on now into months of this, um, it's time to start making that outdoor space feel permanent, feel a little more intent intentional. Uh, the reason being, again, this is going to like trigger in 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 your guest's mind like that. This is a space I'm going to go back to. As this maybe lingers on, and it's a month from now. If I went to the place where it was like you know plastic furniture outside, um, you know, and you had put some cones in your parking lot, okay, it was you know good like that worked. I wanted to go out. I was there, but you know, am I going to think about that place as a place I want to go back to? You know, any effort that you can put into kind of making that space feel a little more permanent will go a long way. I was at a brewery up in Maine um, not long ago, and they had just like taken pallets and kind of instead of just cones in the parking lot, they had used pallets to kind of create like a makeshift fence that felt actually kind of nice. And they had put some flower boxes on top. And it's, you know, it doesn't have to be expensive, but it, 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 it did feel like they were making a real effort. Um, and it's something that I remember as a nice space that I'd go back to. Um, offer all the distanced options that you can on premise. Contactless online. We saw the example just a little bit ago about the app. Very cool. Um, I was just down here in Asheville. I went to Stone's um, Beer Garden just to check that out. They have a full contact free experience. You scan a QR code at your table, order, pay online. They bring it right out to you. Um, I think those options are are really powerful right now, and honestly, could be really valuable moving forward. I mean. You know, that's going to change kind of the way the consumer interacts with us going forward, maybe allowing you to serve even more tables on the flip side of this, where if you don't need necessarily as much staff 
if you do keep that as an option, hey, I can order right from my phone from the table, uh, I think that could be really powerful. This is time, like we just heard kind of about telling your brand story and all, right now is a really good time to showcase your personality. Um, I showed you those signs we made, the metal signs, and we uh, had noticed somebody pointed out to us, they shared with us that somebody was using that as their uh, dating profile picture, you know, with them holding sanitized and available. So we whipped up uh, some t-shirts that say sanitized and available, you know, a small run, very popular. We see them, uh, you know, a lot of people kind of uh, tagging us on social media, wearing their sanitized and available shirts. Um, we had a, an incident with like a real kind of a jerk leaving us a voicemail. Um, you know, a lot, you know, as, as we know, we're dealing with a lot of different kinds of customers right now. People are confused by a lot of things. Um, we had somebody who was very, uh, you know, frustrated and left us this really, really mean voicemail. And so we kind of like, his name, you know, his name was Wayne. It's pretty funny. Uh, I don't have, you know, the ability to play it on here, but if you look up, don't be like Wayne, if you just search that, um, we turned it into a, a quick little, you know, 30 second video, um, which got a ton of, of traffic, a, a, a great kind of upswell of support from, you know, from people that um, were familiar with our brand and people that had never heard of us that were like, oh yeah, don't be like Wayne. He's like the guy, Karen. We actually spun that uh, over the summer into a beer uh, in a nonconformist series of beers we do uh, called, you know, don't be like Wayne. And, uh, you know, again, got like a lot of fun um, kind of spread of our brand personality. Um, I just saw, I just took this picture on the left yesterday here at Asheville Brewing. You know, a great way to kind of like, I, I like the way that, I mean, I, I'm probably going to steal some version of this sign. Do not enter if you have symptoms of COVID-19. And then they list you know, racism, bigotry, xenophobia. Uh, it's like a great way to kind of showcase a little bit of where they stand, a little bit of their personality. It, it covers, you know, it touches on like the political side of things, which is like so you know, risky from a marketing standpoint, but it does it in a way that really doesn't, you know, it, it's not political. It's like saying, hey, we don't want these people here. And at the bottom, you probably can't read it, but it says, um, if you have any of these symptoms, we are probably not the brewery that you're looking for. Um, I love that kind of like showcasing a little bit of your personality. We're hands off in our ability to really interact one on one. But, you know, some of these things are really doing a nice job of, of showcasing kind of what that experience would be like one-on-one -on -one, uh, if we were able to have it. Speaking of off-premise, you know, like you're not able to be one-on-one. -on -one. A lot of people just want stuff to go. They're coming in, supporting you. They want to buy beer from you, um, you know, promote to go. Promote that as, a, as an option. If you have to-go sales, if you're allowed to sell to-go, make sure that that's really clear even in-house, not just online, you know, maybe not just on your website and social media platforms, but do I know when I'm sitting in your tap room or your brewery or your brew pub, uh, is it clear to me I can take beer with me? Uh, can I take draft beer with me? Uh, do you have crawlers? Do you have growler fills? Like, what are my options to take beer home? More than ever, this is like your your easy sell is capturing that right um, right inside of the of the tap room experience, promoting um, to go. Um, nobody knows what what the future brings here. You know, we are looking at you know positive news on vaccine front, but also like negative news on like this you know this this sudden um, splurge. Uh, um, so, you know, like make sure that you let people know so that they, if they change their tune of their comfort level of coming out, that they know, Hey, you know what? I did love that beer though. I'm going to swing back there, um, and pick up some, get, you know, some beer to go, uh, crawlers, cans, guest beers, you know, what can I take away? Um, you know, make sure that you're, you're letting people know what they can go. If they're doing it to go order with you and you do food or beer or whatever it is, check and double check every order you lose the ability to fix, you know, what you can on premise when somebody's sitting at a table, oh, you know, the server forgot my ketchup. Oh, let me get that right to you, right? We can't do that when when that person has driven home. Um, you know, if you are missing a part of the order or whatever, it's extremely important um, that you're double checking, triple checking the contents of every order. Uh, provide obvious missing items or check on them. Um, one thing that we're having our kitchen do is if somebody orders something that obviously like should, you know, that you would, you would think that they would want to side with, um, you know, maybe they're ordering our, our steak tips, for example, and they didn't order a sauce because they didn't understand that, you know, the thing, or maybe they didn't want one, but you know what? It takes two seconds to quickly text them and say, Hey, you know, did you, did you mean to have a sauce in there? Make sure that you're, you know, you don't want that to get home and them to be like, Oh man, I, I didn't get a sauce with this or whatever. 
in some cases where it's really obvious, we're telling our, you know, our, our expos, just throw it in there, just put it in the to-go bag. It doesn't hurt. Um, you know, encourage a return visit. Two great examples I have here on this, um, these video, uh, the, these pictures. Top corner, you know, the the four pack, um, pack tech holders, right? You know, maybe you don't really need them back. You don't want them back. You know, you're not going to reuse them at your brewery, but it's a great way to get somebody back in the door. Um, this was a sticker on the top of um, uh, one brewery that just basically said 25 cents uh, off of your next beer when you bring um, your next purchase when you bring the four pack holder back. What I love about that is like, even if it has nothing to do with the four, you know, the pack tech holder at all, it's, it's about getting someone back in the door. It's someone being like, you know what, if I have a stack of these now from the three, four packs I bought last time, I'm going to swing back in. And it's obviously in all of our interest, we make more money on our package beer if you buy it from us directly than we do if you buy it from the, you know, the package store. So it's a great way to kind of encourage people to maybe make that step to come back to you. Um, four pack carriers, surprise thank you gift. Little, uh, this little pouch here on the bottom right corner um, had a chocolate chip cookie in it. Uh, stick just stick a, a homemade cookie in there they cost nothing right these uh these pow these little baggies they cut you know you get like a thousand of them printed for you know works out to like a few cents a piece just saying thank you hey your support right now means so much to us we can't wait to be sharing a beer in person again soon um your friends you know and then you can put your brewery name on there um, a great way to kind of say uh you know to, to trigger someone to be like wow that was really cool um, and like to remind them, you know, maybe encourage them, you know, and provide them that little bit of like extra service that you would have done in person that you really can't now that we're completely isolated. Um, use the data that you're collecting. Are you collecting guest registrations, contact tracing information? Um, when people place an order online, you know, how are you communicating with them? In our case, we, you know, we, we text, we collect their phone number, we text them when their order is ready. We, you know, text them um, when, you know, when they're on-premise and their order's ready for pickup. We text them if they're ordering something to go and their order's ready for pickup. So we have that information. Very easy to feed that into an automated system that quickly sends them a quick text, you know, an hour after the, the first text that just says, hey, how was everything? Um, what could we have done differently? Use the data that you're collecting. Send a, an email. We send an automated email once a week with all of the guest registration contact information that we've collected, just saying, how was everything? What could we be doing differently? How can we make you feel more comfortable, you know, visiting us in, in this, you know, this crazy time? You collect some really good data. It's also a great way to reach out to those people that say, hey, everything was amazing and ask them, you know what would be great right now? We could really use your help if you would, if you wouldn't mind posting a, a positive review for us somewhere on the internet. Um, you know, every little bit like that helps right now. So take advantage of those opportunities you know, email, SMS, um, segment these people. Um, if you do email and text marketing as an ongoing thing, make sure that you're putting these people into segments in whatever program you're using, saying that they were on-premise. Um, it's a great market segment to identify these people were comfortable coming to our brew pub, our tap room, our, our tasting room during a pandemic. That's a, a really good um, piece of information that you can reach out to those people. Again, it, where we see how the future, you know, comes around, you're not marketing to people that were only ordering to go. Same way on the opposite side. If they were to go order, put them in a to go segment so that you aren't marketing to them to come in because maybe they're not comfortable with that. So you're like conveying the right message to the right customer. Really um, powerful right now. That's like my little uh, quick presentation, my 15 minutes. Um, I am personally online at um, with the uh, on Instagram um, as here for the beer, uh, but Whetstone Station is our brand um, on Instagram, Facebook, all those places. It's Whetstone Craft Beers um, at Whetstone Station. So um, we're up in beautiful Brattleboro, Vermont, and we are currently open um, for on premise and to go. Um, bars in Vermont have been shut down again um, by the governor, however. Uh, because we have a full dining experience at our um, riverfront location, we are able to, to stay open. Um, so happy to take any questions uh, about what we talked about or to just talk about something completely different. Tim. Yeah. yeah. A lot of great uh, information. I really appreciate that. Uh, 
uh, well to an overview on uh, steps that uh, breweries can be taken to really make their guests feel comfortable during these times. Um, you know, back in March, uh, kind of most of the industry shut down, uh, you know, throughout the, the country. And I was kind of curious uh, with your uh, experience and uh, the information you have access to through the BA and uh, um, your wealth of knowledge. Uh, looking at the industry as a whole, what did you see uh, when breweries pivoted to more to-go sales, um, off-premise, things like that, and then tried to reopen uh, that breweries did really well? And then, and what do you see as an industry as a whole where we really could have uh, done a bit better? I think, I mean, honestly, as an industry, I think breweries did fant a fantastic job in the transition to COVID service. Um, we saw... A lot of places, I mean, breweries had a lot of outdoor dining to begin with. It's always been kind of like a part of the brewery experience that I think really worked was people wanted to be outside, bring their dog, bring their pet. You know, so we uh, we saw a lot of breweries kind of like really dig into um, expanding that where they could. Um, I think sanitation is something, like I said, that I think, you know, we've always done really well. And we were kind of hit the ground running. We also had a lot of us had ac access to sanitizer and things like that in a time that that was really difficult to get. So we saw a lot of really cool camaraderie. I think breweries as a whole have always demonstrated a great, great job of that, like coming together, uh, the unity side of things. I think what we could have done better, um, and I think we still could do better at, is communicating what it means to come visit us. Um, so, you know, every place is different right now. Um, even inside of a single town. I mean, you know, I'm in Asheville right now and everybody's got different rules and, you know, the state has different rules and Asheville as a city has different rules and each each location has its own rules and some places, I mean, it, I think it'd be nice um, if, if everyone was kind of making the effort to put that, you know, on your Google places, you know, listing, put it on, you, untapped, put it, put it in the places that the, the person that would come out right now to support you that wants to do that is looking. Um, I would love to just have like, you know, an easy way to say, okay, I can have a beer there. It, I'm allowed to hang out there for an hour. And, you know, here's, here's what I can take with me. You know, I can take your beer. Oh, I can take other people's beer. That's, you know, um, I think that the guest beer to go thing is a really neat, I would love to support, you know, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to multiple places like I usually do. You know, I'm trying to be super respectful and courteous and really hanging out at places where I can isolate at the location, you know, sit outside in a corner. Um, but Hey, if I can buy a four pack of your beer and a four pack of, you know, the brewery down the street that I'm not going to get to visit. Awesome. You know, I mean, whatever, whatever your options are, let me know because I want to support you. I want to support your staff. Um, I think that that would be, you know, it would help me craft where I would go. You know, when I'm looking at places trying to figure out where I can go, I think we could do a really, you know, a, maybe a better job of that, of being the, the ultimate spot to go somebody who maybe is thinking of bars are closed, right? This is a great example. Vermont just closed bars. Breweries with food are still allowed to be open. Okay, that's that's a huge win, right? Um, if we're mm -hmm. communicating that properly, it's like, hey, you know, we have socially distanced tables, you know, use photography, showcase how far, okay, wow, it's outside. Okay, those tables are spread out. You know, I think if I could see that early, I would make a trip. I would drive, you know, a distance to go to the right place, so. Great. And and so, obviously, everybody here in the uh, kind of the northern part of the country, we're, we're coming into winter, and uh, a lot of the things you mentioned, outdoor dining and things like that, potential for indoor dining to get closed. Um, how do you recommend breweries, um, especially when you're focusing or maybe you have to make this pivot to, to go sales and uh, customers uh, not being able to come and sit down um, at your tap room or at your brewery? Um, how do you help them take that experience home? If your interaction with them is say only 30 seconds, they ordered online, they, they stop by, they get their four pack. It's, you know, it's cold outside. They're getting home. People are hunkering down. Um, how do you, uh, maybe take your tap room experience, your unique experience, like Joel spoke about, you know, you're uh, creating that ambience, but how do you, you know, translate that to when people take their beer home? That's a really good question. It's actually something we just came across on our own, um, you know, trying to deal with like one, one way, one thing that we did was our, our packaging is kind of very clean and it's just like the brand name and it has, you know, it doesn't, it didn't have anything about, didn't have anything like Joel was talking about our brand story. 
Um, we just changed all of our packaging. We were due for a new labeling anyway. Um, and now all of our can uh, labels include like a four line paragraph that tells a story of the product. Um, and they're not like, it's not beer descriptions. We already had that kind of on there, like citrus, hazy, whatever. Um, but it actually had, you know, we now add a little bit about why do we call that beer wet stoner? Why do we call that beer rug life? Um, and I think it's like, it's kind of the, a step in that method of like, how can we make our, you know, share our brand story a bit um, when we don't have that one-on-one -on -one that we always have had, you know, for nine years, we've always had the bartender across the, you know, the beer tender there to talk, to tell you, oh yeah, rug life. This is why we call it that. Um, so yeah. Oh, awesome. Um, I really appreciate that. And uh, we'll definitely be getting some more uh, questions for you, Tim. Um, we're going to move on to uh, uh, Kate, who's going to give us uh, some more background kind of on uh, what uh, the post COVID consumer is going to look like. So um, thanks again, Tim. And I'm going to jump into uh uh, Kate's introduction. Uh, Kate Bernat is a reporter and editor covering the beer industry for Good Beer Hunting and Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, as well as many other outlets. Uh, she was previously the beer editor at Draft Magazine and is a BJCP certified beer judge. In 2020, she re received three awards from the North American Guild of Beer Writers in the categories of Best Business Writing, Best National or International Reporting, and Best Local Reporting. Uh, congratulations on the, all those, uh, uh, Kate, and uh, looking forward to hearing your thoughts on uh, kind of the, the post-COVID uh, consumer and, and what we can kind of expect uh, here uh, in the next couple of years. So uh, take it away. Great. Thank you for that kind introduction and um, thank you for having me. This is really nice to be a part of. Um, yeah, so um, I am Kate Bernat. I am a reporter at Good Beer Hunting where I do news and analysis. Um, and that is primarily where I'm drawing these insights from uh, my reporting as well as um, research that I've done on this topic. So. We are going to decipher the post-COVID beer consumer with the huge caveat that um, post-COVID is probably a long way off. Um, I've heard a lot of brewery owners, business owners, when I'm doing my reporting, refer to next year and post-COVID as the same thing. And um, not to be a bearer of bad news, but I am, I and, and experts are pretty sure that's unlikely. Um, this, was, this graphic that you're looking at is from CIDRIP. This was a um, pretty big presentation they released in April of this year um, where they targeted a post-pandemic America at January to April 2022. Um, and this scenario two was what they called their worst case scenario. And unfortunately, we can see that we are there. Um, we are experiencing a fall peak um, rise in infections. Um, and they had modeled this on um, previous flu pandemics from like 1918, 1957, and 2009. So um, this is their model. It, it appears to be um, bearing itself out. So I think what we need to keep in mind is that if post-COVID is a long way off, we are seeing dramatic permanent shifts in consumer behavior over the course of years that are unlikely to result in a just return to pre-COVID life. So second major caveat, <laughs> I don't think there is an average COVID era drinker. Americans are experiencing the pandemic in very different ways, depending on your location, your age, um, your health, your socioeconomic status. Um, so analysis from IWSR, which is a company that provides data and research on the global beverage alcohol market, basically finds that at the top level, there are two streams of COVID era consumers um, of alcohol in the US and it is the comfortable and the wary. So the comfortable um, are the more narrow slice of Americans as we can see 33%. They um, generally feel better about the status quo. They're kind of still socializing, they're maintaining their social life, they're still spending on alcohol across a range of products. Um, they're more likely to be young and urban um, and many are actually drinking more than before the pandemic, especially um, generations, millennials and younger Gen Z. Um, the reason I put a sort of an asterisk next to younger and urban is that um, we also know that 
young, urban, Black and Latinx Americans are more likely to be frontline and essential workers in the service, hospitality, and healthcare industries who may be facing um, economic risk due to COVID if their hospitality jobs are impacted, and are also more likely to face health risks um, from the pandemic. So I think um, that younger urban part we need to kind of further segment. Um, the wary group, 57% of Americans, the, the majority, um, they tend to be older and suburban. They are less comfortable with the pandemic and, and feeling kind of fearful. So they're spending less per unit of alcohol, but drinking the same um, as before the pandemic. So you can see they're maximizing savings. They might be buying larger format bottles of wine. They might be buying um, larger format packages of beer, and they're much more socializing at home, sort of if at all. And I bring this up because I think it's imperative for breweries to know where their customers fall here. Um, if you feel like most of your customers are in that comfortable category, you're going to wanna be providing them um, kind of unique experiences that might still um, have a sort of on-premise component if that's legal where you are, um, and kind of provide that like unique, still kind of social experience. Whereas if you have the feeling that most of your customers are this wary group, it's about maximizing value. It's about offering them at home options. Um, so I think it's important to think about which of those um, your brewery is primarily serving. Might be both. I think another question a lot of us have right now also is when are drinkers coming back to breweries and tap rooms? Um, this was a poll that the BA did in conjunction with the Harris Poll and Nielsen um, this summer. And um, asking that, uh, asking consumers, once craft breweries are fully reopened, how will your visitation to those breweries change compared to normal circumstances? So this is assuming breweries are open at full capacity. And I'd like to draw our attention to the 25% of regular craft drinkers who say they would visit um, less frequently. I think that's still a pretty, um, that's a significant group. Of course, there are 25% also saying they will visit more. Um, so maybe that balances out. But I think you can't, pres um, we can't ignore that 22% who are saying they'll visit less. Those are regular craft drinkers who are still your customers. Where are you meeting them then, if not at your tap room? Um, is that e commerce? Is that continuing to do curbside? Is that continuing to do delivery if you're doing that? Um, are you shifting more into package distribution? Um, you don't want to just leave those 22% behind because they're still regular drinkers. The long range forecast, um, I think we continue to see people drinking at home. And this is not something that fell out of the sky with COVID. This was kind of an existing, um, an existing trend, as we can see for two decades, the number of on-premise establishments serving alcohol in the US has been decreasing. People are just changing the way they drink to focus more um, on that uh, off-premise drinking. IWSR says the days of the 80% off-premise, 20% on-premise volume split are long gone. And that was, um, you know, without putting COVID on top of it, where people have anxieties about coming to tap rooms, um, where laws have in some places changed to allow more delivery and direct-to-consumer sales of alcohol. Um, to say nothing of like the generational shift also towards online experiences and socializing. I mean, I think about myself, I am a, a millennial, got Gen Z behind me. Um, for us, inviting a friend or two over and on a Saturday night and we order some DoorDash or some Uber Eats and we stream some Netflix or we watch, you know, an online streaming sporting event, that's not weird for us <laughs> and it's not, um, it's the equivalent of what we would have had, what we would have been doing with like a night out at the movies and a restaurant. Like those two do not feel that dramatically different, I think, for certain generations. So um, I think COVID will only be pouring gasoline on the fire of um, trends that already existed towards off-premise consumption. So with that in mind, I wanted to touch quickly on what's working at off-premise. I want to keep this pretty taproom focus, but if we're talking about where people are drinking, maybe we should touch on this. Um, easily understood flavors. I think that's a result of um, the one-stop shopping and 
get in, get out kind of thing. I am not, I used to be such a browser and now it's not like I'm touching 17 bottles and flipping them over and reading paragraphs. Like I, I'm getting in, I'm getting out of the grocery store. And so um, what we're seeing in the research is that a lot of consumers are looking for like very clear flavor cues. I think that's why we see seltzer, IPAs, lagers, and surprisingly fruit beers um, doing really strong off-premise sales uh, during COVID is because um, to use this example of this new Belgian beer, like I have a very clear idea of what I'm getting from this. A sparkling lime lager is going to be citrusy and effervescent and light. And I, I get that within 20 seconds in the aisle um, versus, I don't know, Northern English brown ale. Like if you're not BJCP certified, that's a little bit of a, uh, it's brown. There's nuts, nut brown. I don't know what I'm getting. Um, so I think clarity uh, is a winner here in the grocery aisle over the last few months. Uh, Multi-packs obviously doing well. Higher ABVs um, doing well, especially in the double IPA category. I think that's, especially if they're line priced comparably to a regular IPA, um, if you can get a $12 six pack of double IPA or a $12 six pack of IPA, we're seeing a lot of customers who are drinking at home and now don't have to worry about drunk driving and things like that. Um, going for those higher ABVs at the same price point. And then seasonals, I don't have as much data on because we're kind of coming into the um, peak <laughs> fall and winter for seasonals. But anecdotally, brewery owners have told me that from their tap room, um, like curbside to go, seasonals are doing really well. And um, Samantha Lee from Hopewell Brewing in Chicago mentioned to me that Maybe that's because people don't have any other way to mark the passage of time, <laughs> except with seasonal beers. Um, I don't really have data to back that up, but it checks out with me. A huge question that I have and that I think we should be thinking about um, in the months and years to come is where the third space goes during and after COVID. So by third space, I mean places that are not traditionally on or off premise. So things like sporting events, tap rooms, music venues. Um, millennials make a significant amount of craft beer purchases at those third spaces. And if, um, if millennials and other drinkers are not coming to those sporting events, music venues anymore, how can breweries recoup sales from those really experiential channels going forward? I think we have to start thinking about where people are going instead of these third spaces. And obviously for the most part, that is somewhere in the digital realm, whether they are streaming concerts um, or watching sporting events online, like how can breweries still be part of those events um, that have now moved to a less physical space? Um, so that's a huge question that I am still looking at and I think won't be answered immediately, but um, behooves us to think about. Um, IWSR found that e-commerce sales um, for beer had gone up 300% um, from July, 2020 versus a year ago. So to me, that speaks to like where this third space is going as people are buying um, beer online. And if you're not in e-commerce, I think it's it's certainly worth um, thinking really long and hard about. So this is where you can find more of my writing, goodbearhunting.com slash sightlines. And I am on Twitter. And also now you can ask me questions. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Kate. Uh, and thanks for uh, diving into all that. And uh, um, kind of the data you brought up and, and it leads to a lot of questions and uh, we'll kind of bring in everybody. But the first one for you, Kate, is um, uh, you get the tough job of looking at the crystal ball. And um, you mentioned kind of the first couple of years here and the way uh, trends for consumers are going. Um, what do you see? Uh, and especially since this is the space module, we're talking about spaces and tavern, things like that. Uh, what do you think that looks like in five to 10 years? Yeah. Um, wow. Crystal ball. Totally. Um, but I think um, my gut says that tap rooms become much more like a restaurant experience um, where they're not necessarily the place you go three nights a week, but they're kind of part of um, special occasions or like experiential evenings. So I don't think even going into the pandemic that um, 
that generations today had the experience that say like my grandfather had where he had his local bar that he went to multiple times a week and probably sat on the very same bar stool. Um, when you can find so much entertainment and communication at home, the tap room has to offer something really unique in a physical sense. Um, and to me, that can be something like a patio or a beer garden. If you're a brewery in a really urban area, like that might just not be something that people with apartments can experience. Um, or there's a brewery here in Missoula that has a very extensive um, pinball and arcade game selection, which obviously draws me out even more so than their beer a lot of times. So I think, um, you know, maybe that also even just speaks to like taproom only releases being really important, just giving people a reason to actually visit and think of it as a special occasion, because I think that's how consumers will be thinking of it. That's interesting to think of having to really market to draw people in when it seems like uh, um, my brewery has been around for six years and it seems like people naturally kind of flock towards breweries were a newer thing, especially in here in Pittsburgh, we went from four to um, to over 30 now and uh, and people want to come out and have that experience and to see that shift is, uh, is uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, Tim, uh, do we have you? You're frozen on my screen. Um, hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, once Tim gets back, I kind of a, a question uh, kind of geared towards him, but um, Joel, um, since you're back with us and uh, um, I know uh, Kate uh, had kind of mentioned uh, some of the things that she's seen um, uh, brewery uh, space wise and, and uh, out there in Montana. And I think we wanted to kind of touch on that a little bit. Kate, if you want to talk about the uh, what you're seeing. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. So in terms of how a tap room can really make itself um feel like a distinguished, very unique space. Um, I was gonna use two different examples um, of breweries here in Missoula, so, or in the Missoula area. So one that does a really great job um, in their taproom space is called Imagination Brewing. And um, both of their founders came from like a nonprofit um, and humanitarian background. They were doing overseas aid before they opened the brewery. So they have a, really well set up tap room where there's like space for gathering. And then there's also a smaller kind of area that's set off by a half wall. And it's a, it's a like social justice and environmental and humanitarian library with couches and books you can borrow. And that's like a really cool place to go if you're alone actually, and or, or with one other person. And then the other side of the tap room is kind of for larger groups. Um, and I just feel like the minute you walk in there and you see that library, like, you know exactly where you are. And it's such a unique, um, it kind of has like a coffee shop vibe. So I would contrast that with another brewery that's actually not in Missoula, but in our greater area that, gosh, is like kind of new. And it's just a straight boxy room with no delineation, just tables willy nilly. And the decor is like, signs in the shape of Montana, which is like, okay, like, yes, we are in fact in Montana, but like, there's just not a lot to grab onto there. And the space isn't delineated in any way. And it just feels like a big empty room where I guess you can drink your beer. Um, so I don't know, those two stand out to me as examples of how setting up the physical space can create like nooks and little places for people to plug into versus just a giant empty room kind of free for all. So, um, and thanks for sharing that, Kate, because that's a interesting. Um, I was really curious about Joel's kind of talk of tying things in to, to make people feel um, welcome in a tap room, and uh, and, and kind of have jokingly, um, Tim. Uh, according to Kate, I I think in the next couple of years, everybody's going to be sitting at home drinking seltzers, and, and tap rooms are going to be dead. Uh, so what? Uh, what can uh, tap room or what can brewery owners do to? Um, really help draw um, those consumers back or um, at least get them in for a beer and, and get them to take more beer home. Um, because obviously, um, you know, competing in the supermarket aisles is tough for a lot of small breweries. So a lot of breweries are dependent on the taproom model. Um, and so some of the numbers that, you know, Kate kind of brought up uh, uh, kind of, you know, worry me as a taproom owner. So what advice would you give beyond, you know, what you brought up uh, so succinctly in your presentation? I think uh, Kate actually like really hits a good point of create an experience that I can't have at home. Um, I think, you know, I, 
I'll, I'll use the analogy of like movie theaters. Um, years ago, I was on a panel that was like, they were trying their, you know, local art house theater in, uh, in town was trying to, you know, do a renovation, be more contemporary. And I remember saying, you know, you got to do something that makes this experience more better, you know, elevate it from what I can do at home with my projector and my DVD player. And in the years that followed, we see, you know, AMC big brands going to like those big comfy chairs and like, you know, so in a similar way, like think about like, what does the brewery experience, you know, your tap room experience provide that I can't get um, in my, at home. I mean, and so when there's no COVID, you know, one easy one is community, right? Um, board games, things like that. Uh, that was a big part of kind of our on-premise uh, experiences in, in each of our places. We had, you know, a whole game cabinet, like clean, organized, kept together. Um, you know, we were, you see a lot of breweries doing trivia and uh, music, things that like kind of elevate the experience. Um, I think that's going to become more critical as we kind of emerge. I love the, you know, the example Kate just shared of like the social justice kind of corner. Um, I was at a, a brew pub a few months uh, before COVID that had a, they, they host the town's farmer's market. Um, I thought that was like brilliant. You know, any kind of, you know, thing that kind of wrapped that stuff together. I think, you know, changing why I would go there to, from being to get your beer to being to go to that place. You know, I, I think it speaks too to the, the idea of the permanency. Um, you know, the big difference between like that parking lot tables uh, with traffic cones and like a cool, even if it is stacked pallets, that are table or barrels or, I mean, what, you know, something that's like, Oh, this is fun. Um, you know? Yeah. Like how, how do we reinvent a space that like you want to, that's like one of the mantras we've always used for all of our, our brands. Cause we have a hospitality, you know, we do have campground, we have in, we have all the was, we want to develop spaces, places that we want to go. And we hope that people like us will want to come there too. But, you know, like look at your space and say, like, is this the place I want to go? Nice. Any other comments on that? Or uh, thank you, Tim. That was that was excellent. Um, so, kind of the next question I had uh, is kind of geared towards everybody, but I'm kind of curious on Joel's uh, uh, thoughts on this. Is uh, during the uh, the beer module when uh, um, going over sensory stuff, uh, Liz Pratt uh, uh, made a statement that that really struck me, and and she said that the you know the beer you create does not stop existing after it leaves your brewery. Uh, so more people drinking beer at home, um, Joel, how do we, uh, how do you really take that tap room experience and that storytelling and, uh, and put it into these beers that folks are, are taking home and, you know, um, obviously packaging and things like that, you want the beer to be sh you know, at least shelf stable, be able to last for a little bit longer, but you know, when somebody pulls that beer out of their fridge, uh, since they're not maybe able to come into your tap room right now, how do we make sure that that uh, story is still being told or that that beer resonates with them uh, like it would if they came into, uh, into your tap room? Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think there's, there's any way you can necessarily, you know, verbatim um, create a tap room experience at home. But I, I think it goes back to a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, which is that, you know, if you do your branding uh, diligently, that and, and you have, you know, brand stories and and you 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 know romance your products on your packaging, um, and you make great beers. I mean, that it always goes back to the beer for me. If you're making great beers, uh, people are going to take them home, and they're going to talk about your beers with the people that they're drinking with. Um, spread the gospel of your brewery. But I, I just think it's it's a question of and and there's a brewery I'm thinking of. That does a great example of that. That does a great job of this. Um, uh, a brewery again. It's sort of not. It's not really close to where I live, but it's in British Columbia. But it's called Backcountry, and they and they have the the most incredible um, story, kind of brewery story, brand story on their on their packaging. When you're in the tap room, you feel it. It sort of permeates everything. But even when you take their stuff home, it's the the story lives on. I mean, it's, it, I think it's super important, not just the look of the packaging, but what it actually says about the beers and about the brewery. Um, 
so so to me, um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question directly, but you have a great tapper experience. You have a relationship with that brewery. Uh, you take their beers home, and if if they've extended their branding, you know, to the packaging and and the the, the quality of the products themselves, to me that vibe lives on at home. It's not the same. It's never the same. But it to me, it's all about the branding. It's all about you know, being extremely diligent about capturing little nuances and and little elements that are unique to you. Um, and, you know, without being too specific about it, I, to, to me, that's you, you can you can take that vibe home. But it's you know, it's never going to be at the same level. At the same. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and, you know, it, it's interesting listening to Kate and Tim talk. It's a little bit different up here in Canada. I mean, obviously we, we, you know, we have one tenth the population you guys do. So we have like way less than one tenth the cases of COVID. We have the same, um, you know, people are taking it very seriously up here. It's uh, every brewery I've been to has a lot of, you know, um, uh, social distancing. Everything is, is kind of the same as what you guys are seeing. Um, but I find that most of the tap rooms I go to now, they're not, they're not a lot less busy than they used to be. Um, they're still pretty busy. Now, people are sitting separately. They're further apart. But I, I, my, my sense is that people are craving that social atmosphere, arguably even more than they did before. They, they can't execute it the same way. But I'm not seeing people staying away. And I'm not, you guys weren't saying this, but I'm not seeing people staying away from tap rooms and droves. I, pretty sure when COVID starts to, you know, the, the impact starts to lessen that people are going to return in, in larger numbers. But even now um, with all the social distancing measures in place and all the other, the seating and every, the way everything's been changed, I still find people, even though they're further apart, you can tell they're still pretty excited about being there, pretty excited about being, you know, sort of, in a normal environment or an environment that that's one of their happy places. Um, right. So I, I, I'm sort of encouraged to see that even though it, it looks a little different, it feels a little different. It's still tap rooms are still a place where people want to go. Albeit, yeah. And, and maybe that's a search for familiarity uh, right now that people are looking for. And it uh, reminds me of, um, uh, Bill Kovaleski, who's uh, one of the founders and owners of uh, Victory Brewing here in Pennsylvania, uh, he always talks a lot about um, how consumers, when uh, when choosing beers, they either go to what's comfortable or what's exciting. And um, so this question is kind of geared towards Kate is, uh, what do you see consumers uh, leaning towards more right now? Is it uh, is it what they're familiar with, what's comfortable, maybe that search for familiarity, or is it what's new and exciting, like the the new hot seltzer that's uh, coming out? Yeah, so I see this playing out very differently um, for like packaging decisions at grocery stores or big box stores, drug stores, whatever, and uh, direct from the tap room sales. So when I'm looking at grocery stores, I'm seeing the data showing familiarity is ruling, like flagships, sales are up, like, you know, Boston Lager and Sierra Nevada Pale Ale and things like that. I think that's not just a search for like comfort, but it's the familiar expectations. Like I mentioned, like, I want to know what I'm getting. They're often available, a lot of multi-packs, a lot of like good pricing, um, they're, they're where people are shopping in like CVSs and stuff like that anyway. So I think that's, what's driving a lot of those sales and in groceries. I do think people are making those split second decisions and picking what they know. Then though, what I'm hearing from a lot of taproom focused breweries is that, um, when people are browsing their stuff, you know, online and deciding what they want to get for curbside or delivery, that's where people are being more experimental because they want that like special thing on a Friday night to look forward to. So that's where they're kind of like picking some bolder flavors, some newer beers. Um, I know uh, a lot of breweries saw really good success with like their fresh hop beers this year because it was timely and it felt different. Um, so I think it is a double tiered kind of reaction depending on where people are shopping. But I think that's good news for taproom focused breweries is that there's still room for your wacky different stuff um, because people are looking for like something exciting to do at home. And maybe that's as simple as opening a beer these days. 
That's great. Thank you, Kate. Um, as uh, we look like we're kind of uh, wrapping up, I wanted to see if uh, uh, any of our three distinguished panelists had any other um, uh, points they'd like to, to make about uh, what they see coming down the pipeline for, for taproom spaces and, uh, and what breweries can do to uh, you know, utilize the space they have um, and, uh, and to continue to attract customers to their breweries and, and be able to sell beers. So um, we'll just kind of go around the horn. Um, so we'll uh, go in the order that we started. So we'll start with Joel. Well, I think I'm just going to reinforce. I mean, I think in, in our own way, we've all said a lot of similar things um, about, you know, taproom space. And d d again, I'll repeat for the like umpteenth time that uh, I think it's it's about consistent branding. I think it's about really being diligent about that, um, about having a why, about a point of difference, something unique that you can leverage. And and again, leveraging your surroundings uh, without being overt, like, you know, Kate was saying about, you know, sign shaped like Montana, there's nothing wrong with that, but, you know, something that's a little more creative um, and and creating a space where, like Tim was saying, I, I, I believe that if you do your branding properly and you've created something unique, a, a unique space, and, you know, beer quality is a big part of that, people leave that room saying they, they might not even be able to uh, put their finger on what it is or articulate it, you know, in a strategic way, but they say that place was cool. I, I'm, I'm going back because it just had elements that I found attractive and, and I saw creativity. It made me think whoever, whoever the owners are, they, they put some work into this. They thought about it. Those places are out there. And I know when I go into one, I can't even necessarily, having been in you know hundreds of tap rooms, I can't even necessarily put my finger on the exact elements. But as a combination, I know that it goes on my list of you know top. When people say to me, "What's your favorite tap rooms?" It's those places. I don't care where they are. Um, unlike you know, Kate was saying in the chat room, you know, there's a place that she likes, but the beer's like meh. Uh, to me, the beer has to be there too. Um, but that, that's what it's about for me is, and Tim said it a couple of times, um, you create a space where people say, I'm going back. I'm definitely going back. I feel good in that place. It's it's a happy place for me. So that to me comes from really good branding, from checking off all those super important boxes. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Joel. Really appreciate your time and thank you for being on with us. And uh, we'll kick it over to Tim. What are your thoughts? Um. I think, you know, I mean, I echo everything that, you know, that's been shared today, but one point I guess we didn't talk about on like, you know, the looking forward thing, Brian, you talked, you, you know, you said winter is coming. Um, I think it's going to be really important that you communicate what your winter situation is. I know a lot of people are scrambling right now to do heaters, um, you know, walls, outdoor, whatever. I mean, like, um, I think it's going to be really, there are going to be people that are going to want to go out. You know, I mean, even if there is a short burst of like, okay, everyone's hunkered down again to try, you're going to, everyone's going to reach that point of exhaustion. We're all, a lot of us are already there. It's like, I do want to go out and have this experience. Um, I think showcasing what you're doing, you know, outdoor is going to be on them on everyone's mind. Can I go be outside? Um, I think, you know, sharing what you're doing, branding it, you know, like Joel saying really uh, accordingly, like for example, our beer garden, we're trying, we're going to keep it open all winter long. I mean, that's not something we've ever done before, uh, but we rebranded it as the Whetstone Winter Garden to kind of set the tone of like what you'll expect, um, you know, and we're doing right now photos and all with people like in their ski gear outside with a beer in their gloved hand, you know, pointing out, we're going to try, you know, we have like a little heater. I mean, we're trying, but like, you know, it's still Vermont. Uh, and so, you know, setting the tone though, of like what to expect there. And I'm hoping that that kind of becomes a thing that's fun and that people think about maybe next year, even when this is behind us and like, Oh, I, you know, I want to go to that winter garden place again. Uh, kind of like Joel said, you know, like when there's that, the trigger of like that experience being something different or interesting. And it's like, you know, that, that was cool. I could stand out there in my snow pants and have a beer. So I think communicating that stuff is going to be really important. Um, 
Awesome. And thank you, Tim, for uh, for joining us even uh, during your travels. Uh, yeah, really appreciate you being here with us. And uh, Kate, kind of some uh, closing thoughts. Yeah, I think um, if we're thinking about forward looking winter, what can taproom focus breweries be doing? Um, two things, two points, I guess I would make that I've seen um, work for breweries that I've spoken to. One um, is a brewery that uh, in Chicago that closed um, its tap room um, when mandated to do so by the local government, um, bought three coolers <laughs> to sell more retail bottles out of out of that space. And they ended up saying, you know what, this is something we've been meaning to do, actually, like, we'd love to sell more to go beer out of our own tap room. So like, this is actually a long term investment that's going to pay off for us, even when things look different. Um, so I think that's something to keep in mind is how can you increase retail sales from your own tap room to go? And then also how can that infrastructure support you months from now? And then the second one um, is a little, maybe a little more philosophical, but as a tap room supporting other businesses that have supported you. So maybe if there's a local restaurant that sends a lot of business your way, like, could you be selling, I don't know, their jarred sauce during this time? Um, it's small, it's not going to keep their business afloat, but um, it's really like a really nice way to stand in solidarity with other businesses. Um, or if there's a band that plays at your tap room like once a month, like can you stream their show and, and maybe sell crawlers along with that? I don't know. Like keeping those relationships together because you're going to need them in the coming months. And maybe there's a way for both of you to kind of lean on each other. So, um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm hopeful. I hope my presentation wasn't gloomy. Um, I really am hopeful and I want to see as many breweries. Um, next year as as are in existence this year so thank you for yeah. having me yes and thank you for uh for being on kate not gloomy at all just a, a good look at uh how we need to approach things and i think everybody made good points from uh marketing is key to uh communicating to the consumer to uh obviously extending that extra support to uh other local small businesses um as everybody's trying to support local um, I think that uh, bringing us to our conclusion, um, I'm just going to make one last plug for the uh, uh, Pittsburgh Brewers Guild um, and PittsburghBreweries.com. So if you're ever in the uh, Pittsburgh area, uh, please jump on and uh, check out uh, our website and uh, put together a nice brewery tour and uh, help support the local breweries around here. And uh, thank you once again to Marcus and Adam and everybody at the MBAA. Um, I've been... Uh, through all the uh, modules this morning, I've enjoyed everything that you guys have put together and we appreciate you um, putting this uh, together and helping us put together these great panels. And uh, once again, thank you again to uh, Joel, Tim and Kate for uh, uh, spending your afternoons with us. Um, th thanks for that, Brian. And obviously thank, uh, thank you personally for taking the time to, to join us today. Um, just before we click through a couple of these stills to, to finish off, um, uh, I've been looking for for a while to find a way for the Master Brewers and the Pittsburgh Brewers Guild to to work together, and um, I kind of came up with a half ass idea that wasn't particularly well developed, and I, I gave Mike T a call, um, not really knowing what was going to happen next. And as I was kind of on the phone with him, I came up with that idea of the compass graphic and uh, told him I had more going on than I probably did. So it's great to see that probably three, four months later, that manifestation of, of both of the groups coming together um, has delivered the, the stuff that we saw today. Um, it's gonna be a little bit more interesting than, than planned, probably the next short term with the, the closures in um, uh, the lockdowns in, in uh, Philadelphia today, kicking in Friday, um, and some voluntary taproom shutdowns over, over Western PA. It's, uh, it's not gonna get any better real quick. Um, so that's it. Um, we're going to thank, obviously, our sponsors, BSG, and we're going to thank them by playing a, an ad at the end, which will just be the clip out. Um, again, craft beer professionals, um, I think Adam underestimated their numbers at 10,000. It's, it's closer to 11. Um, if you're on Facebook, get onto that group, and they will send you in the right direction for their own events and other events as well. Thanks uh, once again, of course, to the Pittsburgh Brewers Guild, and then thanks to... The little tiny master brewer sign. We try and be humble, so we went with the smallest sign. Um, and at that, it's it's sign out. So if you want to play that ad, Adam, we're um we're out of here. What we're talking about is a uh, two million, uh, two million, million pound investment, investment to allow us to, to, to bag brewing malts, brewing malt, 
This is the first facility of its kind in Scotland to have all this capability at scale. This gives us an awful lot of different options for packaging formats for different types of customers all over the world. This project is exciting because it will bring jobs into the local economy and it's something we can tell our consumers about very proudly. Customers demand to know more about what they're consuming. With a short supply chain we're able to do that more effectively. Chris Malt are very concerned about their carbon footprint. The small batches means that there's a more of a direct line of sight from the farm to the end customer. More locally sourced products allow us more flexibility within the supply chain. Preserving that connection and that provenance, but also that relationship between farmers and brewers in Scotland is a really exciting proposition.